You're looking for the latest Georgia Bulldog news in football, basketball, baseball, and recruiting. Then you are in the right place. Then you are in the right place. It's third down. Bryce Young's career. You need ten. Play clock at four. From the pocket. Launching downfield. Underground and intercepted. Keely Ringo has an escort down the sidelines. Georgia is going to conquer the Crimson Tide. Hosted by Jeremiah Stoddard and Jonathan Williams. Georgia on the mountaintop. Demons be gone and the drought is over. National champions at long last. Just sit back, relax, and prepare yourself for these hot takes you're about to listen to. All right, welcome back to another episode of Classic City Sports. As always, Jeremiah Stoddard along with my buddy Jonathan Williams. Uh, Exciting episode to give you again this week. Every week is a great week after Georgia, you know, defended their national title and came back to back again. Every week feels, you know, like a, a happy week, right? But this week we do have some stuff to go over. There has been some roster movement with the transfer portal window coming to a close. Uh, so everybody had to kind of put their name in there when they were going to go. All that kind of stuff. Most names have declared for the NFL draft outside of one guy that we are still waiting on an answer from as well. Um, some other circumstances have kind of gotten in the way of his decision right now so that they're giving him a little bit of time. We'll see how that plays out in the next few days, I assume. Uh, but we'll go ahead and jump straight into it as well. Jonathan, lots of movement in the transfer portal. Uh, we, Georgia got a couple of people earlier in, in the, uh, you know, couple, past couple of weeks, you know, you went out and got a couple wide receivers, that kind of thing to come to Georgia. Um, some news on the other side where you have people going out and obviously there's a big name that everybody's been talking about today as far as transferring out of Georgia. So I'll go ahead and kick it over to you to get us started. Yeah, it's it's expected at this point. This is, Georgia is no stranger to this. Whether you know people going to the portal, and of course you're going to have guys entering the draft, which it, which they had a mixture of both. But you've also had some valuable names announced that they are going to be returning, like Lad McConkey, Kendall Milton, Nazir Stackhouse also announced that he's going to be returning. So some big names there that Georgia will be getting back for the 2023 season. But you also got guys leaving, guys searching for better opportunity because. When you are as talented as Georgia, there's a lot of really good football players on that roster and you recruit regularly at a high rate and battles are going to be taking place and guys are going to find their spot on the depth chart. And eventually you got to make a move that's best for you. And that's kind of, I think, what you've seen with guys like MJ Sherman hitting the portal, Dominic Blaylock hitting the portal, guys that are hard to see leave. Those are guys that you don't necessarily want to see leave because especially a guy like Dominic Blaylock, who has been a part of this program for such a long time. You know, he's all the way back to 2019, that freshman year with him and George Pickens. They both showed some special things and then some injuries got in the way. And he ended up being here a lot longer than what many probably expect him to be. And now he's searching for some better opportunity. And you can't blame the guy. He's a really he's a high talent, but Georgia just also has a lot of guys in that wide receiver room. But yeah, the biggest name, obviously, at the transfer portal. And it, I think a lot of Georgia fans got really frustrated because the transfer portal window closed for today and then it'll open back up early in the springtime for about another week or two. And Georgia was getting through it. And, you know, most, a lot of the names that hit the portal, nobody was really like, oh, well, that's a huge surprise. A lot of them were probably like, okay, I could kind of see that coming. I understand it. And then it was like within the last 48 hours of the transfer portal opening, news started to break that A.D. Mitchell was looking at potentially entering the transfer portal. And Georgia fans just kind of were like, what in the world? Why? But there's always going to be that name, I feel like, that people are like, why would he enter the portal? I don't understand. Jermaine Burton was one last year that Georgia fans kind of had a similar reaction to a little bit. Like, why would you leave now? It seems like you have a great opportunity next year for you to have an even bigger season than you did this year, especially because A.D. Mitchell was hurt most of this last year. But now he's entering the portal and there's schools being floated around about where he might go. Maybe he ends up back home in Texas, maybe USC, a lot of different names being thrown around. But, yeah, it was a big surprise. But at the end of the day, you just want to wish these kids the best. You want to, As you and I have always advocated on this platform, you just want the kids to make the best decision for themselves. You want them to have a great career. And your fans should always just be grateful for what those players did for them in a red and black jersey. You know, A.D. Mitchell had some great moments as a Georgia Bulldog. Won the national title, essentially, back last year. Aside from Keely Ringo's pick six, he had the, the – um, 
the game leading um, touchdown there late in the game. And then he's caught a pass in every single playoff game for Georgia over the last two years. So some great moments as a dog, but unfortunately he won't end his career as a dog, but still thankful for all those moments. And you just got to move on from it. And if AD Mitchell feels that's his best, his best choice, then that's his best choice. And he's got to go with that and live with that. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I, shocker there. We, we agree on how like the stance to take on this. Um, but you, you brought up the exact thing that I was going to as well. It's eerily sim- like extremely similar to uh, the, the Jermaine Burton thing. And I sat here and I was like, all right, guys, I mean, just a few weeks ago, maybe like a month and a half ago, I was talking about Jermaine Burton because everybody was popping up on the timeline, talking about him again, it kind of bashing him from like UGA perspective. And I was like, I'm, I'm tired of it. Like, why are y'all still even talking about him? Why are y'all still focused on what he's doing to the point where like you're going out of your way to like check his stats and then tweet about it and say, oh, guess what? You're sitting on your couch while Georgia's going to the playoffs. Who cares, man? He made the decision he thinks is best for him, and he's got to live with that at the end of the day. You don't. As a Georgia fan, you get to you you should be able to move on, focus on who is here, and then just enjoy that, right? And and get used to that. And like you just said a second ago with A.D. Mitchell, he's played a crucial part in Georgia's big games and, and big wins over the past two seasons. He has been – a, a very important piece in the two national championship teams. Uh, this year, he's been hurt so much that, you know, during the regular season, you didn't really get that much of it. But when when the playoffs started, uh, you know, you get the SEC championship game. I think he scored a touchdown on the SEC championship game, too. He's, he scores he touchdowns threw, in like he threw, he threw the two-point conversion, I think, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. He threw, yeah, yeah. Um, so basically, he's scored in every single postseason game you know, that George has played with him essentially at this point. And so he's definitely been a very important role player for Georgia in this in this back-to-back championship run. So it's going to be something where Georgia fans have to look at it and go, man, he's gone, you know, love the guy. And now he's gone, going somewhere else. You know, hopefully people don't take the same approach they did with, you know, Burton, where they start hating on him and taking shots at him and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully they they handle a little differently you know I will you will obviously but we did with Burton as well so but I mean honestly at the end of the day when they when they decide to go somewhere else they're doing what they think is best for them for whatever reason it is it doesn't have to make sense to you and I or anybody else it has to make sense to them and their families Um, there is speculation that he has a, a a son in Texas you know out that way and the speculation is he's gonna go to Texas uh, as far as what school he's going to transfer to, technically he just entered the portal today and he hasn't announced that, but we've been hearing stuff about Texas for a while now at this point. And, you know, he wasn't even in the portal yet. So that's a whole tampering conversation. That's kind of beside the point, obviously uh, uh, of where we're at right now, but that's just the way of college football. And like what's, you know, what Stan's saying in, in the comments, welcome to the NIL landscape at this point in time, just because a player is an important role on your team doesn't mean that he will stick around, you know, why he's still got eligibility. It doesn't mean that he won't be contacted by other places and talked about these opportunities and things that he can do. It is what it is at this point, but I, I'm going to miss him. I think he's done a lot for us. I, I will celebrate whatever he does somewhere else. As long as he doesn't come out and talk bad about Georgia, then I wouldn't say anything negative about the kid as well. Wish the best for him. Um, Georgia gets to go after their third national championship next season he didn't play a big role throughout the regular season, so Georgia should be okay next year. That's the next part of this conversation. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going to go next. Georgia went 11-0 and without A.D. Mitchell, and I wrote a reaction article to A.D. hitting the portal, and I was like, what does this mean for Georgia? And I put it kind of towards the bottom of the article. I basically said, like, well, you, Georgia has some comfortability around this subject because they just had to play without A.D. Mitchell pretty much throughout the entire regular season – and the mm-hmm. offense was still really productive. You know, guys like Ladd McConkey, Brock Bowers stepped up, and you're getting Ra Ra Thomas from Mississippi State, who's going to be that X wide receiver, probably. That's what he played at Mississippi State. Really good football player. I kind of went back and looked at his film while he was at Mississippi State. And there's a lot of things that jump off the page when you're looking at him or jump off the film in this sense. Body control, really physical, excels at. Um, bringing in the contested catch like he's just a game maker man like he's a game changer out there on the outside so he'll be really fun to watch I think Georgia fans are really going to like him and the Dominic Lovett from Missouri he's your more slot guy about 5'10 180 pounds so he'll be in there kind of what doing what Ladd McConkey's doing or whatnot but he's a game breaker like Robert Thomas is a game changer 
Dominic Love is a game breaker. He had three different games with Missouri where he went for over 130 yards. His best game was against South Carolina, I want to say, for 10 receptions and 148 yards. Like That dude's got the burners, and he can beat you Pretty deep, good. and he'll beat you over the Pretty top. Good. So Georgia's got plenty of weapons still. You know, we talked about a couple weeks ago when Georgia closed out their recruiting class for the 2023 cycle for the early signing day period that they brought in a lot of talent, like Tyler Williams and Yazid Haynes, names like that at the wide receiver they position. They focused on the you wide receiver guys. position in this class, yeah. Absolutely. And then you, you still got Dylan Bell. You still got um, – Marcus or Simi Jack Saint, you you got a lot of guys still in that room. Denylon Morissette, there's still a lot of talented football players on that wide receiver depth chart. So I say all of that to basically say in short, Georgia is going to be okay. Yes, of course, having AD Mitchell still on this roster going into the 23, 2023 season would have been a big step up, would have been a huge plus to still have him on the roster pairing up with Ra Ra Thomas. Sure. You could have done so many different things as an offense with all of those guys in there. But Georgia's going to be okay. And I think that's probably why, you know, writing may have been on the wall for a little bit about A.D. Mitchell leaving, which is why Kirby Smart goes out there and snags a Ra Ra Thomas and goes and gets a Dominic Lovett because at the end of the day, Kirby Smart's running a program and he's got to make a decision that's the best for his program. Kind of like what the Atlanta Braves did with Freddie Freeman. You know, you would love to have Freddie yeah. Freeman come back and play for your organization. But at the end of the day, Alex Anthopoulos had to make a decision that was best for the organization and he had to go get Matt Olson so that way he wasn't burned and just left with a question mark at that position and didn't really have anything to do and was left scrambling. So I think that's kind of what you saw with Kirby Smart and Georgia with them going and getting those two guys. And now Georgia's not going to miss a beat on offense. You get Carson Beck rolling in there. He's going to work with them all spring, all throughout the summer, going into the fall. And Georgia's offense is going to be really something special this coming year. Absolutely. And like you said, I think the writing was definitely on the wall. You, you, Nobody can convince me that uh, there hasn't already been some type of conversation between A.D. Mitchell and Kirby Smart weeks ago, at minimum weeks ago, where he knew – that there was a huge chance that he would be making that step, you know, which obviously Kirby was like, okay, that's fine. We'll go do what we need to do. You do what you need to do. And it's a business at the end. Of, like we talk about that so much at this point, college football has become a business on both sides. Kirby smart is running a company essentially like he is running a business and he has to make business hard business decisions when it comes to roster management and things of that nature. And then these players have to make the the business decision that impacts the rest of their entire lives. You know what I mean? Like they, they have to decide if they decide to go to a school and it doesn't pan out at that point, it might've messed up their career, their ability to get to the NFL and all of that kind of stuff. So when they make that decision, they're the ones risking everything by doing that. And so Kirby smart has to respond on the other side and make another business decision, go out there and get those guys that you just mentioned. And that'll be able to kind of alleviate the loss of AD Mitchell. Honestly, I would love to have A.D. Mitchell back next year. But after going out and getting Ra-Ra Thomas and Dominic Lovett, do, do you think that Georgia actually has a step off at wide receiver this season? Because in my opinion, they don't. I, I really don't think they have a step off. Because you go get both of them, I think you might be you're, – you're better at wide receiver this year overall as an entire unit. I think Georgia's wide receiver unit will be better this season than it was. Now, would it have been better with – A.D. Mitchell? Absolutely. But I don't think that they go out and get, like you said, Ra-Ra Thomas with A.D. Mitchell expected to be on the roster anymore. I think that that was something that Kirby did knowing that the whole A.D. Mitchell stuff was about to shake out. Look, look, Brock Bowers and Lyle McConkie combined for 17, like a little over 1,700 receiving yards this past year. That's nearly half of Stetson Bennett's passing yards this last year. That, that's almost half of your passing offense from last season that will be returning. And then, as I mentioned before, Ra Ra Thomas and Dominic Lovett both led Missouri and Mississippi State in receiving this past season. And Ra Ra Thomas had seven touchdowns this past season, I want to say. Like, you're mm -hmm. getting some really good guys. That's the whole point is that you're not going to miss a beat. Georgia's going to be fine. The offense is going to be okay. I mean, what they're returning on offense is what we've been talking about this, this entire time. The fact that Georgia gets Brock Bowers for another season. Season only because he has come back. That's the only reason why you're getting Brock Bowers in a top year. five pick like, if he left this but, year, even on it. Like, legitimately. No doubt. Top five pick if he would have left two years ago. So, but getting sure. him back and getting Lad McConkey back, you know, all, all these people can come out there and crack their jokes about, like, about Lad McConkey announcing that he's returning is saying, like, oh, well, what else was he going to do? Like, damn on you for that. I guarantee you there's a lot of NFL GMs right now that would love to take their chance on a Lad McConkie, a guy that's going to run a 4-4 in the 40 more than likely, a guy that's a jitterbug in the open field that could, makes guys miss. He's just an athlete. A yep. lot of NFL GMs would take a chance on a guy like that. 
So you can hate on the kid all you want, but he's proven you wrong once and he'll do it again. Like this was a guy. There's that a reason in, that he never, was the leading wide receiver on the team, right? He, he yeah. was targeted heavily, played a, an important role with the team all season long. Yes, Brock Bowers was the overall had the most receiving yards, but as a receiver, the person playing receiving, like that that specific position, that was Ladd McConkey on this team. Even with Dominic Blaylock and Marcus Rosemey, Jack Saint, and, and Kiaris Jackson, and all these other guys that they could have gone to. So that tells you that he is, in fact, a baller. I mean, and there's no doubt about it. Yeah, he's a smaller guy, but, you know, we've seen plenty of smaller wide receivers in the league make money. I mean, shoot, Devontae Smith, he's a little dude. I mean, he's he's maybe a buck eighty, scrawny. soaking wet. Yeah, he's uh, he's like a. I'm surprised Look, I'm he hasn't a scrawny looking dude. Half. He's scrawnier than me, and sh- like he's short, he's scrawny, and but he's he's still playing well in the NFL, and that because the size of the guy doesn't mean they aren't capable of performing well in the so NFL, especially that at that slot receiver. You, you got to have that dog. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but. So he's definitely got a chance. Uh, honestly, and, you know, I'm going to jump back a little bit to what uh, we were talking about a minute ago. We going back to the receivers leaving and all that kind of stuff. I'm more upset to see uh, Dominic Blaylock leave just because of the role that he's had with Georgia over. You know, like I just I've been pulling for the kid. His fresh, like you said earlier, you brought this up a minute ago. His freshman season, it was him, uh, Lawrence Cager, and George Pickens. Those were the receivers that you had all season. And George Pickens was playing extremely well, obviously. But Marcus, or uh, um, but Blaylock was he was lighting it up until he got hurt in the SEC championship game against LSU in 2019. He was absolutely going off that season. He was having a good year. He looked explosive. He looked to have a bright future. Tears his ACL, comes back again, you know, and tears his ACL again, and then. Then he's dealing with hamstring issues. He just has never been healthy since that that LSU game in 2019. And I, it's one of those things that I look back on and go, if he stays healthy, what will he be? Well, he, he would be a name in Georgia history that you talk about, in my opinion, if he had stayed healthy. Because mm-hmm. he just he, he looked so promising. He really did look so promising. So to see him have to walk away... Uh, to go find you know playing time because that receiving roster is so deep at Georgia right now. That's the only way he's going to get a chance to do something. Um, I hate it because I love the dude, but I, I'm pulling for him. I, I will pull for him as hard as I've pulled for any player that has transferred out of Georgia uh, for, to succeed. I, I wish nothing but the best for him. We'll see how it plays out, but I hope he makes it to the league. I think he's capable yeah. of it. I can't help but laugh at this comment from my dad. And I, the only reason why I'm laughing at it is because he starts it off with saying stat of the day. And if you don't follow me on Twitter, a lot of my tweets start out with stat of the day, blah, 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 blah. So it's just funny to kind of see that this runs in the family. But the doctor, the lead doctor, Dr. Senior, is coming in here dropping his own stats. And he's saying you that have to Kenny McIntosh had 75 <laughs> targets thrown his way in UJ, at his UJ career, and he caught all 75. I made a tweet That's earlier this week. That's pretty dang impressive. I made a tweet earlier this week saying that Kenny McIntosh was the first Georgia running back to ever have 800-plus rushing yards and 500-plus receiving yards. So that tells you how versatile he is, and we've known that. He's a stud. And another stud I'm going to talk about, I know I've been in here pumping the Ra Ra Thomas hype train already, but I'm going to do this one as well. Another X receiver that kind of similar to a Dominic Blaylock in a sense of a guy that's already been here for a little while and he's had, um, unfortunately, some injuries have gotten in the way. And Elijah's talking about him in the comments right now. Elijah, um, Marcus Rossini, yep. Jack Saint. I think that's a guy that could really turn a corner this next season. I He was someone that we mentioned it before on this podcast about – Anytime Georgia needed a big play, it seemed like Marcus or Simi Jack Saint was stepping up, making a big play on third and 15 or third and 11 or on third down in general. He was finding his way towards the football, and number one was making big plays, flash plays out there on the football field. And with more opportunity now for him, you know, he got a lot of he got a lot of run this season because A.D. Mitchell was hurt. And I know that Ra Ra Thomas is coming in now, but I think he could still get a lot of run. Guys that block their hind in off on the football field are going to get oh, run does in Georgia. He ever? And he's someone that does. Oh, my God. So. I think he's going to see a lot more playing time this next season. And I think he's someone that could really turn a corner this next year and put up some pretty solid numbers. I, I like a lot about Marcus Rossini Jack Saint. He's a grinder. And guys that find their way towards the football in big moments, those are guys that you'll always take on the roster. And that's what he's always been during his time as a Bulldog. So he's someone that I would definitely kind of mark as an X factor this upcoming year and someone that could potentially explode. It's a make or break season for him, I think. You know what I mean? Like it's it's one of those years that he can come out there and absolutely put on and and become that star type player overall. Uh, he he's capable of it. 
like you said, what he he got he's the one that uh, broke his ankle against Florida mm-hmm. on his first career Florida. touchdown, his mm-hmm. first career touchdown, and that was a nasty one too. Um, so that's a tough one to come back from, and but he's he's definitely capable of of putting a good season together next year. You know, he's going to be competing. Ra Ra Thomas coming in is not guaranteed a starting spot, like you know the no. number one guy. So it's a competition this spring for those guys, and it's it's Marcus's chance to go out there and prove that he's the one that should be getting the majority of the targets or the majority of the snaps at the X receiver spot. We'll see how it plays out, um, but I I would love to see him succeed. I, I've been excited about him for a while as well. Um, but overall, I think you're I think you're going to be okay at wide receiver. I really don't think that you you're going to be hurting, and it's it, it's been weird on Twitter and stuff, seeing like the reaction to the AD Mitchell stuff, you see some people out there going, you know, I mean, he's leaving, so don't call him a, a DGD, right? Like he's, he's, he's not that right. I mean, the dude contributed to so much of like your championship runs. So I think he's, he's worth, you know, he's definitely a good, a good dog at, at that, you know, he's leaving, he's choosing to go somewhere else. Hopefully he succeeds somewhere else as well, but you can't control that. Uh, when they decide to go somewhere else like that, but what you can do is reload. Like you, what we talk about Georgia under Kirby Smart. What does he do anytime there's some type of deficiency at any type of position? I mean, he absolutely fills that spot up through the transfer portal. He's done it every year. He's done something of that nature. He's gone out to get a player. Whenever you look at a position group and you go, "Man, that's a little tight," he goes and fills it with somebody. You know, between going to get Tyke Smith and Darian Kendrick. Um, and uh, Eli Wolf at tight end when there was a Trey deficiency McKitty. before Trey McKitty before you had those t- the tight ends you currently have on the roster um, he goes out and gets guys that you need and so that's what he did this time as well you, what what we have learned at Georgia is Kirby Smart knows what he's doing we might look at oh, it and say yeah it looks like there's a problem there might be a problem at that position. I mean, he's already working on it before we can even mm. think of before we before we ever notice it. He's already got the plan in place of what to you're, do about it. You're telling me that the guy that just won back to back national titles <laughs> he knows might what have he's a doing. freaking clue at what he's doing <laughs> and how to ro- manage a freaking roster? Mind blown right there. <laughs> goodness gracious. I mean, goodness. <laughs> Captain Obvious over here, but no, it's not that obvious because I mean I think people still are a little unsettled just because I think if I think if more so anything, it's not necessarily caution directed towards Kirby Smart and the coaching staff. It's caution directed towards the world of college football that we are in right now. You know, you you hinted at tampering in regards to this AD Mitchell situation. Uh, tampering's been a thing, and, and Brooks has been one that's <laughs> talked about this so many times. The game been broke, you just ain't woke. That's how he always puts it. The game been broke. College football has been this way for a long time. You're just now finding out about it, but it's been this way. So it happens that, yep. you know, it's a dirty it's game sometimes. Open, yeah, the game gets dirty sometimes, and it's unfortunate that it happens. But Georgia's going to be okay, and that's the end of the line. I think, uh, you know, some of these departures that are happening, you, I think Kyrus Jackson's definitely one that you throw in there as just – Hate to see happy, him go, too. You hate, hate to see him go, but you're happy to see him end his career as a Georgia Bulldog because there were times in his career where he definitely, yeah. definitely, definitely, definitely could have gone elsewhere and probably been a solid starting receiver for somebody else, especially in the SEC. A lot of people could have used a Kyrus Jackson. I loved his quote this past year that he used about – I ain't worried about stats. I'm worried about putting numbers up on these walls. That's what I'm worried about. SEC championships, national yep. championships. He gets to leave as a two-time champion, and he gets to leave as an SEC champion as well. So those are feel-good stories that you love to hear. Darnell Washington, a guy that a lot of people thought last year was going to enter the transfer portal. He comes back. He gets to leave as a two-time champion, someone that – and I think fans just really, really fell in love with Darnell after this last year because you really got to see him do what he was actually capable of. And you saw oh, man. all aspects of his game on the yeah. field every single weekend. He was just a super special athlete. You will never, you will never, 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 never have another Darnell Washington on Georgia's roster. I'll go ahead and tell you so right versatile, now. He was so versatile, man. He was so <laughs> versatile. Six, seven, 260-pound tight ends do not grow on trees, ladies and gentlemen. I'll, I'll, I hate to break the news to you, but those are not Especially guys occurrence. at that size hurtling defenders. Let's – let's like, I mean, good God. I mean, he started – that's how he started the season this year. He starts the season against Oregon, jumping over people at that that's size. Ridiculous. And it's just – you're going, oh, he's like that, huh? He He's like that. Okay, that's cool. Good to know. I mean, and he had a career high uh, in, you know, receptions and uh, yardage and stuff, obviously, this year. And then he's such a good end-of-line blocker. 
and and just blocking in general. He blocks his tail off till the till the whistle's blown. He's blocking 10, 15 yards downfield at times. Um, and I think that that's something that Georgia right now. I think we talked about this before. That's that's going to be something Georgia misses. You know, I right now on this roster you don't have a guy at tight end that can block like Darnell Washington did. So to put somebody no. else on the end of the line, I, I don't know who I don't know who's going to be Georgia's end of line tight end blocker next year. Uh, because right now it's it's hard to see. It's definitely not Brock Bowers. He's way too important uh in the passing game and stuff to to lock down on the end of the line like that. And nor is he really the same type of blocker there as well. Uh Oscar Delp, I mean he's also a similar style to Brock Bowers, uh, Pierce Sperling coming in, he's the same type. He's he he's never really put his hand in the dirt. We saw that. He talked about it in his his interview after the All American Bowl. We talked about this last week, I think, or two weeks ago, whenever it was. Um, all of it is just they're they're not that type of guy on the roster. And then you still had you had um, Godey just left, uh, Seether just left. Um, you had a couple other people transfer out. So it's going to be really interesting to see what Kirby does at that position. Or what Georgia has done so often in the past is you you don't have that guy, scheme around it. That's what Kirby and mm-hmm. Todd Munkin have been able to do so well. When you don't have something, just make it a non-factor. So I'm that's one of the things that I am most excited to see what Georgia does about that this coming season. As weird as it is, I'm, I'm really wondering who's going to be that end-of-line blocker at tight end for Georgia this year. I think something that was good to see is that in Ohio, against Ohio State, Georgia still stuck with 12 personnel with Oscar Delp and Brock Bowers in there because Darnell Washington was hurt. He got hurt. And he was mm-hmm. he sat out for the rest of the game for the majority of the game. But Oscar Delp got a lot of run in there, and they stuck with 12-man personnel, and they were pretty successful with it still. So, yeah, I mean, as people are saying in the comments, Delp's going to get bigger. He'll put on some muscle. He gets a whole other offseason with Ron Corson and those guys, the strength and conditioning program sure. and whatnot. So – Everything's going to be okay there. Brock Bowers has really developed as a blocker himself, so they're going to figure it out. I think tall personal might look a little bit different, obviously. It's not going to look the same as it did with Darnell and Brock Bowers, but that's okay. Munkin will figure it out. So you're going to be fine at tight end regardless. And it's it's actually – it actually might even be a little bit more daunting lining up Oscar Delp and Brock Bowers both on the field than it maybe was with – Darnell Washington and Brock a different Bowers type of because, threat. Yeah, it's definitely yeah, a, different a different type. type of threat. Yeah, maybe not more of a threat, but it's a different type of threat. And yeah. almost like there's still a lot to worry about it from a defensive perspective from that point, just because they're they're very similar. Both are your modern day tight ends, but both are really really good modern day tight ends. They're really really high talent players. So being definitely will be interesting to see how that happens. I saw something that our guy Zach mentioned in the comments, and I wanted to touch on this. He said, I won't panic unless Schumann or Munkin leave. I'm not going to touch on the Schumann right now. There's just some little rumors that Bama's coming um, his way a little bit, which why would they not? You know, guy that's from Alabama, got roots over there, was with Kirby at Alabama. So, but of course, they're going to come calling. You're going to have guys sniffing around your program when you have as much success as Georgia does. But I want to specifically talk about the Todd Munkin one because this is not the first time that Georgia has had or will have to fend off the NFL coaching scheme of Todd Munkin. That's where he came from when Georgia brought him in. That's where he's been for a lot of his career. He's He's been a coach for 33 years, guys. He's been all over the United States as a coach, and he's been doing this for a really long time. But what I do want to bring up about Todd Munkin is some quotes that he provided during the media availability that he was given during the, the playoff run. And someone asked him kind of about, you know, you got some NFL guys kind of sniffing your way, kind of throwing some money at you, potentially offering you some jobs. What are your comments on that? And he straight up basically goes like, you know, the grass ain't always greener. I don't do this for the money. He said, I'm not in it for the money. He's like, you know, the money's great. And that's obviously another plus to the job, but I'm not in it for the money. He said, the most important thing to me is I want to win ball games. And he said, I would rather be coaching an undefeated football team in Alaska than I would a four and eight team in San Diego. So that tells you how much that guy loves winning and who's been, winning the most games of college football the last two years. It's Georgia. In fact, since Todd Munkin took over as offensive coordinator, Georgia is 38 and three, I want to say overall as a team. So they've done a lot of winning since Todd Munkin's been here. He's the highest paid assistant coach in all of college football. Georgia is doing everything necessary to keep that guy around. He seems happy. Brooks got him to freaking smile in a photo the other day at the parade, which is not a very common occurrence. So the guy looks happy. He was chilling and vibing out. I got a picture of him snuggled up with his blanket on the trailer. So he's having a good time. He loves Athens. I think you can tell that. And there's really not any ideals. This is something you 
talked to me about before the show started, you mentioned it's like, yeah, there's really not any prime positions that are very appetizing, if you will, for anybody to go after in the NFL landscape right now. Like the job openings that are there, I'm not sure Todd Munkin would want to make that kind of jump to go and be an offensive coordinator. They're rebuild of, situations. Rebuilding, exactly. When you could just be at Georgia and try and three-peat this year, and you're pretty much guaranteed almost to go undefeated again this next regular season if all things fall into place. The regular season, yeah, you should be undefeated again going for a playoff spot. You make over $2 million a year. You're the highest paid assistant in college football. Um like you said, the grass ain't always greener. You know, there might be a job that sits there and wants to pay him a little bit more or something, but it's going to be a a rebuild situation. Or he could go in there and things aren't really working out, and he could be on the brinks of getting fired after a year or two over there because it's hard to turn around an NFL franchise. I mean, how often we do we see a team sit at the bottom of the like the rankings in the NFL for years to come? You know what I mean? Like right now, Houston is a terrible football team. And they have been for a few seasons. It takes a long time. We saw the Browns be god-awful for like decades. I mean, they were so bad for so long. Jacksonville was so bad for so long. And they're finally starting to turn some stuff around. And um, it's just, the NFL, if you're a bad team in the NFL, it does take a while to climb back up out of that. And like you said, sometimes just being on a winning football team is a lot more enjoyable. Like, even if you don't make as much money, you can just enjoy your job more because you're successful. Your team is successful. You get to enjoy it rather than stress about everything so much. And the ar- other argument that you know college football has that the NFL you don't have to do is the recruiting side of it. But quite frankly, I, I, I don't. I don't think that Todd Munkin does as much of the traveling for recruiting stuff that other offensive coordinators do. I think that Kirby you, Smart yeah. brought him in and said, "Call plays, make our offense good on Saturdays." We'll, we'll get you the players and you can help us find players you want, but I'm not going to make you do all of like the, the crazy recruiting stuff that other offensive coordinators have to do because that's not really, you know, you, you do come from the NFL. That's not exactly your forte, what you want to have to deal with. So I don't think that it like you can even take that into consideration as far as you don't have to do this in the NFL because I don't think he has to do too much of that at Georgia right now in general, Man, other yeah. than, hey, shake this guy's hand. Uh, you want this guy on your team. So, you know, kind of just talk to him for a minute. Just, you know, that's it. Yeah, I mean, if you think that Georgia is putting Todd Munkin in a helicopter the Thursday before a game, say, down at Jordan Hare or that's something like that, happen. so we need you to go out to California <laughs> and talk to this player that we're trying to recruit to come play wide receiver for us, you're out of your mind. But he, They are not doing that to him. Todd Munkin is sitting at Georgia doing his thing as an offensive coordinator. He's in his bag, as he always is. And he's helping recruit the quarterbacks. That's what Todd Munkin's doing right now. Yep. And, yeah, he's going to pitch in every now and then with the other offensive players, and he's going to do what he needs to do to get those guys in here. But Todd Munkin's going to go get the Carson Becks, the Gunnar Stocktons, the Brock Vandegrifts, and whatnot, and then he's going to go on about his day and call a freaking masterful game on Saturdays. That's what he's here yep. to do. That's what you pay him to do. And he's worth every damn penny. So, like I said, Georgia's in a really good position to retain him. They've done it for the last two years. I've mentioned so many times before that – Todd Munkin has only stayed with the same team one other time in his career for more than three years. And it was Eastern Michigan in like 1993 to 1998, I believe it was. Something along the lines of that. So the fact that he's even potentially coming back to Georgia for a fourth year says enough about where Georgia is. It says enough about what Georgia has become and what they're going to be. And if he does if he does come back for a fourth year, it tells you everything you need to know about what Georgia will be in 2023. Because as I said, the Joker loves to win. He loves winning ball games. That's what's most important to him. So if he's coming back to Georgia this next year, you better – you can bet everything in the freaking bank that Georgia will be winning a lot of ball games in 2023. For sure. And the other thing we talked about a month ago or whenever it was, it's hard to, to remember exactly when it was, but we talked about it on here. When Buster Faulkner took the job to go to um, to Georgia Tech as the offensive coordinator, to me that was a pretty telling sign that Georgia said, all right, we'll, we'll let you go because – we think we have Munkin for a while because there yeah, was a lot of talk. Like mm-hmm. there was a lot of talk about Buster Faulkner being the next offensive coordinator for Georgia when Todd Munkin decided to go. The fact that they let him leave tells me that Munkin and Kirby are on the same page as far as like it would probably take a lot to get him out of here. Um, and and so I I don't I'm not too concerned about that either because that that was a big sign for us. Whenever that was, I know that was before that was after the SEC championship game. So it's been over a month or something like that, or at least a month at this point. 
Um, so I, yeah, I, I don't think it's something you really have to be too concerned about myself. Yeah. So, I mean, all in all, I think Georgia did a pretty good job in regards to retaining a lot of guys, or let me rephrase this. I think Georgia is still in a good standing after the first portal window comes to close. It comes to close tonight at midnight. Georgia's in the clear at this point. You're not going to have any more guys enter the portal. The next time you'll have to worry about it. Uh, I can't remember if it's in March or April. First week of May. It, or May. First week it's of May. May. It's after, so after spring, spring ball camp, ends and stuff like that. After all that, guys are really going to get a good glimpse of where they're standing at the depth chart at that point, and then you'll have to kind of worry about it again. The guys that are going to start entering the portal again, which you will have more of those and whatnot, but that, again, will. that's just part of the business. So, But you don't have to worry about it anymore because it's going to come to a close tonight, and then you just get to start preparing for the next season and enjoy being back-to-back -back national champs. That's what you should be doing anyways if you're a fan of the Georgia Bulldogs. Just – Sitting there proud on your on your um, pedestal and looking down upon everybody else in college football and talking your crap on Twitter. Go do it, man. It's talking season now, and you have every right to go do it. So go talk your stuff on there and get everybody else hell. Give those Florida fans hell because, boy, are they down bad right now. <laughs> They're Ooh. struggling. So go poke the bear a little bit over there. Enjoy it. Enjoy the off season Again, we're going to keep pumping out the content for you guys. We brought it to you tonight. We did some roster management stuff. Maybe we'll dabble into some basketball. Georgia actually has a pretty good basketball program right now. Shout out to, to Mike, Mike White. Basketball. There's no longer a deadbeat horse to continue beating because Mike White is doing his <laughs> thing and has Georgia in a really good standing right Man. now. Baseball season is a little bit around the corner. Maybe we'll get into that as well. You know, me and Sauter both love some baseball. So that should be, the that content's going to keep coming. Yep. The content's going to stay. We're going to keep bringing it to you. There's always plenty to talk about in regards to Georgia football because there's so many great players to cover. There's so many great things coming out of that program. So we're going to keep bringing it to you. We enjoy you guys tuning in this week with us, chopping it up about the transfer portal, talking about roster movement and whatnot. Hopefully we maybe calm the nerves off of you a little bit, or maybe gave you a better glimpse as to what the wide receiver situation will look like next year with Ra Ra Thomas and Dominic Lovett and the guys that will be returning. So hopefully you're feeling good about that. And as always, like, subscribe if you haven't already. Those likes and those subscriptions really help us out. It helps us to continue to grow. So we appreciate that as always. Support us on social media. I ain't got to read those ads anymore. You guys know the drill by now. You guys are trained soldiers at this point. You guys know the, every single step of the way that this episode goes. And now you can guess what time it is now. Stoddard, it is your part of the episode. All right, fellas. As always, keep it classy in the classic city. Uh, go enjoy your time in the off season as back-to-back -back national champions. And uh, we will catch you guys next week with some more content. We'll see y'all. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Classic City Sports. Take a second to subscribe, rate, review, and share with your friends and family. Feel free to reach out to the Classic City Sports crew on Twitter with any topics you'd like discussed. You can reach out to Jeremiah at The Stodfather, to Jonathan at Dr. Underscore J. Will, and make sure to follow at Classic City Pod for show updates. Check back next week for a brand new episode. In the meantime... To the superwords, which express the sentiments of the entire Bulldog Nation.